All right, hi everyone. My name is Kahong, and the four of us here are really excited to presenting to you a number of HCI theories that we've been researching over the past couple of weeks. Now, Justin is going to be talking about Hickheimer's law, while Violet will be covering Fitt's law, and finally, we have Hui Shan who'll be sharing with us more about Huard's model of bimanual skill. But before we dive into the theory, I'd like to get a volunteer to come up here and uh, perform a simple task for us. Can I get a volunteer from the class? As expected, there's no one. So, can I ask the guy in the green shirt in the front to come up here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I'd just like you to use the camera application on the iPad to take a photo of the class. And we want to actually see how he uses iPad on the screen. <laughs> yeah, and just hold up and pull up. Thank you very much. For this. Um, all right, so all of you here are just gonna watch our friend uh, use the iPad camera to take a photo of the class, and you might be wondering what this is gonna do with any of the three HCI theories that I mentioned earlier. And so the idea is that at the end of this presentation, when the slides come back up, you're going to find out how Hickheimer's law, Fitt's law, as well as Guard's model of bimanual skill actually relates to the scenario of our friend here taking a photo with the camera. Justin? So all this began in 1983, where these three young, handsome men over here, Stuart Cut, Tom Sparrow, and Alan Newell, proposed two general psychological theoretic models, the Hickheimer's law, <coughs> and a big dog. But before I dwell further into the topic, I have to give you a brief overview of the information theory. What is information theory? It is none other than a quantification of information. And with this, com uh, with this we come up with the concept of entropy. Now we're going to ask, what is entropy? Again, entropy is really just the measurement of the average number of beats required uh, of a symbol to be transmitted over. Now take a look at these two examples over here. On the left, you have the flipping of an unbiased coin. On the right, you have the throwing of the dice. Unbiased dice. Now my question to you is, which of these two has the higher entropy? Any answers? Byron, how about you? Just pick one. Neither. Because <laughs> <laughs> from what you say, entropy is the measuring of which I'm not sure what I is. Well, that, that is a good answer also, but actually the real answer is the throwing on the dice. But good effort from you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, the reason is, the reason is, um, the throwing of a dice will yield six equal outcomes compared to a flipping of a coin, which will yield only two. What am I trying to drive at over here? is that Higgs law and Fitt's law are just based on analogies of the general model of communication system <coughs> developed by Claude Shannon in 1948. And recall the scenario that was played out by our friendly volunteer in green just now, where he had a bit of difficulty trying to find the, the camera app. And after much try, he finally located it in this photography folder. So in this primitive model of Higgs law, um, what he actually did in his mind, I presume, was that he split the screen into half, and then a quarter, and one eighth, and so on and so forth, to finally locate the camera app within the photography folder. In the next two slides will be slightly more mathematical, but I can assure you that it's going to be rather, rather easy. <laughs> And um, I'm going to go through this because Higgs law is actually quite mathematical and um, just now what I, what I just said was rather primitive. So what is H? H is the entropy. Entropy, and uh, let me recap again, is the average number of bits transmitted in a message. And it's just calculated by a summation of um, PI, which is the I alternative of, uh, which gives you the information theoretic entropy. In other words, the probability of the outcome. And multiply by the log 2 of 1 over pi plus 1. Quite easy. Now, <laughs> Higgs law is slightly simpler. Actually, it's very easy. It's a very easy formula. P, which is the reaction time, uh, 
of a person when given a, a set of equal choices uh, is equals to b multiplied by log 2. Log 2 is because of um, binary search when you um, kind of imagine it, doing it in your mind, multiplied by n plus 1. B over here is the constant that can be um, calculated by drawing a best fit line through the measured data that you have. And plus one is because of the uncertainty when you're making a choice. Now, I want to make a note over here. Recall the previous slide where we have the entropy. P i log 2 1 over p i plus 1. And the next slide where you had the, the Higgs law formula, B equals log 2 n plus 1. But take note, this formula over here is only for equal probabilities. What about unequal? Very simple. T equals, just substitute this entire formula into this part over here, which gives you T equals pH. So simple. Now you appreciate the elegance of mathematics, isn't it? Okay, so what am I trying to drive at over here? That Higgs law is really just the time taken, all the response time needed for a person to make an option. And finally, why is it difficult to apply Higgs law? Because it requires us to codify equivalent events into alternatives. In other words, imagine you have an iPad screen over here, and like what I mentioned earlier, you're going to split the screen into half, one eighth, uh, half one quarter, one eighth, so on and so forth, until you get into the individual pixels. And when you get to that point, when you're quantifying pixels, it becomes overly, overly simplistic and impractical. And in contemporary HCI, um, where um, interfaces are now more complex with multi-dimensional stimuli. It is really quite difficult to apply Higgs law in reality. And now Violet will share with us what is Higgs law, and I promise you it will be less boring. Alright, thank you, Justin. Alright, so now what is Fitz law? You might think that oh, it's another boring law that, you know, whatever Justin just said now. Okay, now basically Fitz law is a model to account for the time it takes for your pointer, let's say, to reach your destination target object. So depending, it will depend on your size and the distance of the object. So before we dive into the formula, let's take a look at an example of how Fitz law is so-called badly applied in the image. So can you spot any errors with the image? Well, other than the dot piloting the jet plane, of course. Anybody? Yeah. Alright, okay, it's because the ejector seat um, lever, 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 is actually in the midst of all the other more commonly used switches. Okay, this becomes a problem because if the pilot accidentally switches this on, it means he flies out of the plane. You know, there's no undo, there's no, I gotta go back, no. Okay? It means that applying that in, in application, our designing of an application, it means that I cannot put, let's say, a cancel button so close to the OK button that after I type a long, you know, text, and I want to click OK, but I accidentally click cancel, and then you go, oh, I got to rewrite it. You know, it doesn't make sense, right? So, in this way, we need to understand how how far away we should put different buttons, or how near, or how big we should put the this button. So we're going to explore that more. All right. So before that, the formula. Okay, this looks a bit more less intimidating than you know Higgs law. So I'm going to simply explain to you, T is for the, of course the time taken, A and B are the um, variables that is dependent on the users, the environment, even the pointing device, and then D over W will be the um, distance over the width of the target object. Alright, so before we go into the application of Fitz law, we want to look further into these two aspects that I want to focus on, edges. Okay, do you know if you open, let's say, a paint application or Photoshop, the two bars are always by default on the left. Do you know why? Now, before I explain to you this, I let me just go on to the next one. Alright, so for hot corners, um, all the Mac users here, I believe you know what are hot corners. So for those who don't, I'll just very simply, um, very quickly explain it to you. Hot corners are when you swipe your mouse, your track, your mouse device, 
all the way to the four corners, you actually activate a few of the features such as um, starting your screensaver, um, putting your display to sleep, or my personal favourite is to swipe, push all your applications to the side and it reveals your desktop. So I can access to my desktop features with just one swipe. So that itself gives me a very fast access to my desktop. So why did Macintosh use these four corners and why did I explain about the edges? Why did I mention about the edges? It's because screens, um, for edges and sides, for, sorry, for edges and corners, they are actually the fastest for users to access to. It means that all the most convenient features we should make use of these four corners because it creates an imaginary boundary that the real world you cannot see as in a real world. What do I mean? It means that I, my pointer, my mouse pointer, I don't have to directly focus on the top left corner of my mouse. I don't have to focus specifically on that point. It means that I can just drag all the way and it reaches that point no matter what. Alright? So it means that I can access it easier, which means let's say for a Windows application, you know the cross on the red cross yet. Yeah. The, red, the red cross on the window application is the top right. So I don't have to specifically click on it. I can just swipe my mouse over and I can click on it. It's, it's so much easier and so much faster. So now applying it fits law into our design, you know the project that you are going to do, you are about to do. How are you going to design this application? You have to take note of the buttons that you want. You have to make it bigger, more obvious. And of course the targetable area, we don't want users to miss the button by a few inch a uh, few millimeters and get frustrated over the effect. So now concluding this, I would actually pass my time to Kuishan and she'll explain more about we are smaller of bimanual points. So, um, okay, we are smaller of bimanual skills. Um, bimanual control simply means two handed interaction. And uh, we are discover that most of our daily tasks are asymmetric when he's researching about the bimanual skill. So, he also discovered that um, our, both of our hands are actually cooperative when executing a task. So the following tables actually uh, summarize the this model. So um, it categorizes our hand into non-preferred hand and preferred hand. Uh, in the case, uh, if a user is a right-handed user, his right hand will be his preferred hand and left hand will be non-preferred hand. So the role and action of a non-preferred hand is to lead the preferred hand and set a spatial frame of reference for the right hand to, uh, for the preferred hand to work on. It also performs call <coughs> movement and for the preferred hand it follows the non-preferred hand. Works within, within the frame of reference and also perform final movement. So now let's take a look at, at an example. Uh, in this sketch, um, this artist is drawing a car with his right hand holding a pen and the left hand holding a template. This uh, this left hand is his non preferred hand. It makes a uh, bigger movement in the workspace and create a frame for the right hand to work on. So the right hand actually perform uh, final movement by sketching out the outline of the car. Going back to the scenario where our friend took a picture of the class just now, uh, he uses his left hand to hold the iPad uh, by, and leading the right hand. And his, light, his right hand uh, tap on the capture button, which is a precise movement yeah, guided by the left hand. So it's clearly seen that uh, the everyday, our everyday task can be easily related to the two, two laws they have mentioned earlier and the model. So to recap what we have learned today, um, case law is all about response time a, a user needs to make a decision uh, within the given options. And however, case law is more applicable to our our field, which is case data research, because it relates more to the fundamental design of any application. And uh, it emphasizes on bigger targets are uh, easier to click on, and also um, edges and corners of the screen can be quickly accessed. Last but not least, um, the words model of bimanual skill uh, tell us the importance of between hand interaction when designing an interactive system. So uh, that concludes our presentation. Is there any question from the class? <coughs>